Hello photographers, today we're going to talk about the aperture and depth of field relationship. But first, we have to take a quick look at aperture and depth of field separately before we can discuss the relationship between them. We'll start with depth of field, which is the distance between the nearest and farthest things in an image that are in focus. In the photo on the left, the single line of text is all that is in focus, so the depth of field for this photo is about one half inch. Whereas in the photo on the right, almost the entire page of text is in focus, so for that photo, the depth of field is about eight inches. As photographers, we want to be able to control depth of field, sometimes to isolate the subject with shallow depth of field, and sometimes to ensure the entirety of our subject and scene are in focus with greater depth of field. That brings us to the aperture, which is an opening in the lens. The size of that opening controls how much light can get into the camera, and we as photographers control the size of that opening through the aperture setting on the camera. Now with an understanding of both aperture and depth of field, we can get to the relationship between them. And here is how it works. The size of the aperture opening in your lens helps you control the depth of field in your image. The larger the opening is, the shallower the depth of field will be, and the smaller that opening is, the greater the depth of field will be. The reason for this has to do with how light spreads as it travels and how the lens manipulates the light as it passes through the lens to the camera sensor. When you're photographing a subject, light reflects off of the subject and then travels through the lens to be captured by your sensor. As that light travels, it spreads, and when it enters the lens, the glass elements in the lens are working to gather that light back up so that when it strikes the image sensor, it's back as a perfect point. The depth of field in your image is actually defined by how far the light can be spread out and still be gathered back together into a point by the lens. And this brings us back to the aperture. So let's say you're taking a portrait and you focused on the eye of the subject, which is one foot away from the camera. Over here you have the camera, and inside of the lens we have this big aperture opening. As the light bounces off of the eye and travels towards the lens, it's spreading out. And as it goes through the lens element, it's gathered back up into a point right as it hits the sensor. And then you have this point of light bouncing off of the ear, which is one foot and three inches away from the camera. And by the time that light gets to the point where the nose is, it's already spread out into a three inch beam. Now these numbers are completely made up, but for the sake of this example, let's say that the limit for how far the light can be spread and still be focused by the camera is two inches. When the light from the ear gets to the lens, the lens tries to bring it back together, but because it's already spread out too far, instead of bringing it into a point at the image sensor, it comes to a point behind the image sensor. And since the light can't travel past the image sensor, when it strikes the sensor, it's a big bokeh ball of light instead of a small focus point. Now let's look at this again, but with a smaller aperture opening in the lens. We've got the light from the eye spreading out as normal and then getting into the lens. Once inside, we have this smaller aperture so some of that light is actually cut off from entering the camera, which means that effectively, the light is not as spread out as it was with the larger aperture opening. Because we're focused on the eye, that light comes to a perfect point on the sensor as we expect it to. And again, we have the point of light from the ear, which spreads out as normal, and then it hits that aperture inside the lens and gets cut off. Now, if we cut off all this excess light and look at the spread of just the light that is able to pass through the aperture, we have light light from the ear that's not nearly as spread out as before. And for the sake of this example, we'll say it's only spread out to one inch, which is within the range that the lens can focus. What that means is that this point of light is brought together right on the image sensor, rendering it in focus. What this means is that when the aperture opening is smaller, it restricts the light passing through the lens into narrower beams, which keeps it from spreading out too far, meaning that light coming from distances in front of or behind behind the point of focus are more likely to be rendered in focus in the image. And when the aperture opening in the lens is larger, the light that enters the lens is able to spread out more, making it more likely that light coming from distances in front of or behind the point of focus are more likely to be rendered out of focus in the image. Now I want to be clear that this is not a perfect representation of the physics of what happens in the lens, but it does accurately represent the aperture and depth of field relationship. 
In a nutshell, the aperture and depth of field relationship is this. The larger your aperture opening is, the shallower your depth of field will be. And the smaller the aperture opening is, the greater your depth of field will be. So that's how the relationship works. But now let's take a moment to talk about the relationship between the aperture number on the camera and the size of the aperture in the lens. Unfortunately, the aperture number is confusing because the size of the number has an inverse relationship to the size of the opening in the lens. Lens. What that means is that the smaller the aperture number is that you choose, the larger the opening in the lens will be. This is the most important thing to remember because you control the size through the aperture setting on the camera. Now, if you want to learn more about aperture, you should absolutely check out my All About Aperture playlist, which has videos explaining why the numbers are backwards, how not to get confused by the aperture number, my super simple aperture secret, and a whole bunch more. And if you want my quick and easy three-step method for getting the shallowest depth of field possible with your camera and lens, then visit this link right here to get my free shallow depth of field guide. If you have any questions about the aperture and depth of field relationship, let me know down in the comments. And if you want more great photography videos like this, make sure you like this video and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss my future videos. And then you better get out there and take some damn photos. So that's how the relationship works. But now let's take a moment to talk about the relationship. Relationship. Uh...